Do you have a colleague who just doesn't get what design is all about? Yeah, sure you do. Maybe you've tried explaining it to your parents, but they just respond by asking you to fix their printer. If that's the case, then Scott Birkin has written a book for you. Give to them. It's called How Design Makes the World, and it's a great beginner's guide to how design shapes just about everything we interact with in modern society, for better or for worse. It's also a good refresher for those of us who are more well-versed in design. Scott, who has written other best-selling books like The Myths of Innovation and Making Things Happen, does a great job of distilling design concepts down into everyday examples that are accessible and engaging. In our conversation, we chat with Scott about the differences in thinking between designers and engineers, what UX design has to do with deep-sea anglerfish, and how good design is often shaped by understanding the constraints on a product. Go grab a copy of his book, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks for listening. I've worked with lots of search firms, both as a leader searching for new talent for my teams and as an individual exploring new steps in my career, but I trust none more than Wirt & Company. Since 1995, Wirt & Company has been the design community's most trusted search firm, co-founded by a designer and led by a CEO who has in-house operational startup experience. Wirt & Company is guided by the principle that creative leadership is essential to business success. They've helped some of the most admired brands from early stage startup to Fortune 500 build world-class creative teams. We're talking about companies like Airbnb, The New York Times, The Four Seasons, Notion, Figma, Google, Cartier, and Fair. Not bad. If you're looking for a partner to help you find the right person for a critical role, look no further than Wirt & Company. And if you're looking for your next design leadership role, Wirt & Company will guide you through the process as a friend and a champion throughout your journey. They take the time to get to know you, to understand what you need professionally and personally. Whether you're looking for your next role or your next team member, Wirt & Company can help you find a meaningful relationship. Visit wirtco.com to learn more and get in touch. That's W-E-R-T-C-O dot com. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automate the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings. And I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Scott Birkin, welcome to the Design Better podcast. It's great to be here. I'm excited to chat with you guys. Yeah, Scott, you and I, we met many moons ago in New Zealand and hung out, and watched a lovely sunset on the edge of one of the islands there a while back. So awesome to have you on the show and talk a little bit about your new book. Before we talk about that, though, you write a lot of books, right? Yes, I have written, I've written eight books. And this one about design is my most recent. Well, let's talk about how design makes the world. So this is particularly interesting because I think typically we talk to folks on the show about design as it's applied to software, but you're thinking about design in a more pervasive sort of way. Yeah, well, I think there's this big divide in the world and designers tend to be on one side of it. So if you talk to a designer and say, does design make the world? They'll go, yeah, of course it does. Everything is designed. Your chair is designed. Your house is designed. The software you use is designed. Maybe it's not designed well, but it's all designed. But if you talk to everybody else, which is the majority of the human species, you know, six billion people on the planet, how many of them are designers or design trained? Tiny. For most people on the planet, you say design makes the world. They'll go, what? What are you talking about? Design doesn't make the world. Design is how you make things pretty. Design is how maybe you design your website or something. Design is not the fundamental nature for how things in life are good or bad. And so I wrote the book to be the crossover between 
this design community that understands the importance of design, which I agree with, I'm a believer, but most of the world doesn't see design that way. And I think that is probably the biggest problem that design as a community and as a profession has. We have not done a good job at informing the rest of the professional world about why design is important and brought them along to see the value. And so that's the problem I'm trying to solve. And so when we're talking to the uninformed or the skeptical, those who just don't really understand the nature of design and the pervasiveness of it, what are some examples that you often use to help people see, like, here's the thing that you interact with that shapes your behavior and shapes the way that you interact with the world? This is advice I give to every designer. I think there's a, a mistake that somehow we are trained to make, and we all tend to make it, that when we're in these situations and we face someone who doesn't know anything about design, it could be a VP, it could be a client, it could be your friend or your, or your dad, and they, what design, what is that? We go into this mode where we start giving them a taxonomy or a method. We talk about the double diamond. We get into this very abstract, academic way of, talking to people, which is really not effective. It's, it's really self-involved and it's our own inside jargon playbook. The right answer is to say, hey, you don't know about design, but tell me something you love. Tell me something you love to use because everybody has something they love to use. It could be their car. They love driving it. It drives fast. It could be, it could be a video game that they love to play. Everyone has something and you ask them that question and they'll go, oh yeah, I love driving my car. And then you say, well, what do you love about it? And then they'll start, without knowing it, talk in design language. They'll tell you, oh, it's so responsive. It, work, it works so well, I don't have to think about it. It's so intuitive to me. They start using design language, but you don't stop them there. Then you say, hey, tell me something you hate to use. And for those of you listening, we had some struggles with our AV equipment, all three of us did before the show. So they might say, you know, Bluetooth, it works <laughs> unreliably in my house, or there's a spot, my favorite chair, the Wi-Fi there is terrible. Or they'll talk about their microwave oven and how they've used it a hundred times and they always punch in the wrong thing. And you say, oh, tell me more. Why does it frustrate you? Well, because I use it a lot, but it still doesn't seem to be, I can't learn how to use it. I feel like it's my fault. Now, by getting them to talk about their world and their life experience, you have a platform now for telling them, hey, my job and my training is to help people make things that people love to use instead of hate to use them. And if you frame it that way, everyone realizes, okay, I wish there was more stuff in my, in my life that I loved and less stuff that I hated. Or I wish the stuff that we made for our customers was stuff they loved. You're telling me you have methods that can help us do that? Tell me more. And now the framework is of the conversation is entirely different. I never give one example. People ask me what's my favorite thing. And I'm like, my favorite thing is irrelevant. I'm already convinced that design is really important. If I want to convince someone else, I have to start from their world and their context. So Scott, before we started, we were also talking a little bit about your reasons for wanting to write this book. And a big part of that is educating people who are not designers about the value of design. In the class I teach, my colleague Bill Burnett has this nice little thing he goes about through about these different modes of thinking. So there's engineering thinking, and you use engineering thinking when you know the constraints, you know that you need to build a bridge from point A to point B, and you know that civil engineer is going to be trained to be able to accomplish that. Whereas design thinking is much more useful if the constraints aren't always immediately obvious or there's more ambiguity. And since this book is aimed at teaching people who aren't designers to value design, how do you think about you know, talking to an engineer about the value of design and design thinking? I tend to look at this in a very, almost an antiquated way. I don't have a problem with different frameworks or different points of view or different perspectives. I don't also attach that much importance most of the time to the specific language. I think if you had to engineer a bridge, you'd be doing some amount of design work and some amount of engineering work. That just comes along with trying to plan something in total, in total. If you had basic carpentry skills, you were making a shed to put in your backyard, you would do some design work of planning and thinking and exploring, and then you do some engineering work of measuring and making it precise and reliable. I think that they overlap a lot. When I talk to engineers, though, in engineering culture, at least as I know it and experience it in the tech world, engineers love to build. They love to build things. That's what they chose their career for, to build. And it's easy to fall into the trap of building something and making your choices about what it is based on how fun it is to build. I think this is cool. So I'm going to build this feature. I think it's cool. 
but it's different from this is more where the language we're talking about maybe we we line up is that designers or designing a building means asking the question wait who is this for what problem do they have how can i evaluate that how can i prioritize those problems and framing the problem in a way that's more likely to solve a problem for somebody else but depending on which kind of engineering you're talking about like a civil engineer perhaps that's part of how they're trained they have some amount of design training, at least in terms of focusing on solving a problem, that some engineers don't get that training. I think computer science, actually, I studied computer science, is among the worst. There's very little discussion of what problem are we really solving for some other person. It's very much about how do you build something that works fast and doesn't crash, but can anybody do anything with it? Eh, not, not our problem. Scott, you've been in a number of different software companies and you've seen the interaction between design and engineering pretty regularly. What breaks down in that communication as designers are trying to talk to engineers about the work that needs to be done and trying to make the case like, hey, we should actually spend a little extra time in this sprint to get this right because it's a really key workflow or this thing, this animation, it might seem a little fluffy to you, but it's actually a really key part of creating emotional engagement with our audience. That's a common frustrating problem. Whenever any role, whether you're a designer or a writer, and you find frequent tension with another role, that tells me that the person who managed both of those roles is failing. If I'm the VP and the design team works for me and the engineering team works for me, that means I am the connection point for helping both of those roles understand the value of the other and that they need to work as collaborators to make work they both think is great. So anytime someone tells me, oh, the engineering team, is they never listen to us, they blow us off, I'm like, yes, you can take this on individually and try to convince and persuade individual engineers. And there's tactics for that, but it implies a bigger problem that someone who should be valuing both roles doesn't do that. Now, if you told me as an individual I had to try to convince an engineer or something, you can't magically give yourself a good reputation with them in the moment. That's something you have to earn over time. And that's usually how I've been affected with engineers. They trust me because of the history of our relationship together. And that when I suggest something to them, it's not because I want to waste their time. It's because I want to show them a way to make what they're doing better. That helps make something that the people are going to love. That will allow them to have more pride in their finished work because they see the value of thinking about these things that could be blown off. Like you're saying, make it the extra time it's going to take to make something look really fit and finished and have polish and have that little bit of animation stutter that happens when you click on a button to make that go away. That kind of refinement and craftsmanship is something that they've seen the value of because of many conversations we've had. The easy trap to fall into with engineers is they have enough work to do, and anytime someone comes to them to say, hey, here's more work to do, any normal person would resist that. And a lot of design work tends to be, here's more work to do. It's rare for a designer to go to an engineer and say, hey, I have this idea, this stuff on your schedule for next week, we can cut it all and we can go get some beers. Like that never happens, right? So you have to recognize you're always in a position where you are creating friction by change or you are from one perception, you're someone who's giving them more work to do. And that's a tough psychology to be effective with. You have to change that relationship. Scott, in your chapter on ideas and systems, I think you had some things that kind of tie to this idea of the organization really being responsible for a lot of the problems that may occur between teams. And you highlighted three things, designed by dysfunction, designed by committee, and designed by regulation. Do you think you could talk a, a little bit to each of those? Yeah, I think those come actually, uh, Peter Merholtz had a tweet or a blog post where he talked about three, and I borrowed two of them and changed the third. But he deserves credit for that breakdown. One of these limitations we have is in the way that we're trained as designers is we think about designing things. We're partial to things, how things look, how things feel. One of our favorite books is Design of Everyday Things. We're thing-oriented. And we have a harder time seeing that when you're in a team, the team has a design. The team manager arguably, if they're doing a good job, it's a healthy design where the pieces and systems interact together well. But by far, the large inhibitor to good design happening is not the talent of the designers. It's not the talent of the engineers. It's a system by which they make decisions. And they may not even see the system, but that's what decides it. So design by dysfunction means that what goes out the door is really limited by, you know, if people 
don't agree with each other, if they don't trust each other, if there's infighting, if people are working behind each other's backs, then your problem is not the lack of a coherent usability methodology or a design system. Like That's not your problem. Your problem is no matter how good the design system is or your design prototype is, the team is incompetent. It's functionally incompetent. And that's hard news to hear. <laughs> it's disappointing, but that's the reality of design. A design can only be as good as the team, and I mean the wider team, how harmoniously they're able to work together for anything. And so design by regulation, is that's something that people at larger companies experience. There's so many rules. It feels bureaucratic. New ideas continually get shut down just because of the idea killer phrases like, we tried that already. For design to succeed, it has to make its way through the culture and the organization that it's in. So that's what that whole section is about, is recognizing that you could have the most talented designer in the world on a project, but if these other key things for how projects work are not in place, then you'll have bad design. It's just, there's no way around it. In the process of writing this book, I presume you, you came into it with already a, a great deal of understanding about design, how it works, the processes, the teams, all those different pieces you've participated in over the years. Was there anything in the course of writing this book where you discovered something unexpected, maybe a different approach that one organization or one product took? Anything when you're writing this that just surprised you about design that you hadn't thought about before? One of the things I, I always hunt for when I'm writing anything is the history. I think that we repeat a lot of the same patterns because we ask a question and we'll go, we'll go, hey, why is bad design so common? And we'll look around at our own recent experiences and not ask the question, are the patterns by which we're failing and struggling now, is this old? Like 10 years ago, were people complaining about the same thing? 20 years ago, 50 years ago? There was a design talk I heard today where someone was complaining about millennials. And some of those complaints were the same complaints that Socrates had about kids in 400 BC. They don't listen, <laughs> they think they know everything. And so I think there's value in going back to see what earlier people have said about design. And so to answer your question, Victor Papanek is one of my favorite design luminaries. His stance on the value of design and thinking about future generations when you're designing has been a big inspiration for me. And he had this thing that I discovered, this phrase or this distinction about kinds of design that is so important. And we don't talk about it enough because it's buried in a book from 40 years ago. He talked about design for sale versus design for use. And the attitude that most of us have, all three of us are trained as designers. We know about design. And the design community has that same feeling. We know about, we're designers. You marketers, you business people, you don't, we're design, you don't know about design. And Victor Papanak was saying that in a way they do, their just design intention is different. We say design, good design, is designed for use. What will it feel like? How will it work? What will the styles of it, what will that make you feel like? We think about design for use. But marketing and advertising, our kind of design is just designed for sale. To put a clamshell wrapper at Walmart on a toaster oven you buy that's impossible to open without a jackhammer, uh, that's a cheaper way to sell the product that helps sell the product. That clamshell is designed by somebody. There's a team of people that design the wrappers that annoy us. They're designers too. They're just designing for sale. And if we look at it that way, this is a fresh insight to me. If we include these people who do what we call bad design and say, no, they're actually good designers. They have just a very different intention. Now we have a different way to talk to those people and recognize the value of what they do. Even if we don't agree with it, or we think it works against design for use, we can say, oh, they're actually going through a kind of design process. Their just aim is to make profit. Their aim is just to sell more goods. They're not thinking about use because that's not their job. So that gives a different way to interface with people that I know early in my career, I despise these people. I had a personal disdain for people who were working in sales and people who were putting these ads together that had like things that weren't true in them. And whenever I interacted with them, I poisoned any possibility of finding a common ground and a way to get the value of their skills and allow them to get value out of mine. I just poison those interactions. So design for sale, if I had gone to those conversations, oh, I don't like this, but they're designers too. They're just designing for a different intent. Now I may be able to convince them where the sweet spot is 
we can design for sale and design for use at the same time and fulfill both goals. You know, in a way, Apple products do that. We love the out-of-box experience for Apple products. Apple has other problems with their designs and, you know, in terms of sustainability and whatnot, but there are ways to find a sweet spot if you change the view and your lens of what design is. So that was a discovery for me. I did not know that terminology before I worked on the book. So you have a chapter where you talk a bit about redesigning the airline pass <laughs> and at, towards the end of that, <laughs> which as in need of a redesign for sure. But you talk in that chapter about, you know, real design means working with real constraints. So maybe that's another angle you could cover kind of on this topic of what's the design intent. So we have this habit, and it's a therapeutic habit for us. We love to pick on bad design. Whenever someone comes across something that they experience in their life, a bad error message, a product they buy, they can't get it out of the box, we post it on Twitter, we post it on Facebook, or a logo. Every time there's a new logo from some major company, some designer goes, this is terrible. How could they do this? And they start critiquing it and making mock-ups of alternatives, and they do what I call drive-by designing. They only know the output. They don't know what the constraints were. They don't know who the client was. They see the output and then they start tearing it apart. So in the story that Eli's alluding to, a designer posted a picture of his boarding pass back when we still got on airplanes. And he looked at the boarding pass and was like, this is terrible. How could someone design this? And many others have done this in the past. He was not the first one to do it, but he did it. And he got feedback on how bad it was. And he came up with his own ideas and started prototyping them. And a whole discussion ensued but how to make great boarding passes. But what was missing in the first rounds of these conversations was nobody asked the question, what were the people who designed this? What were their goals and what were their constraints? At first, nobody asked that question. This got popular on Twitter. People started asking that question. People who had worked at airlines spoke up and said, well, actually, you don't understand. To cut to the chase of the story, the reality is the constraint is not the design talent. The constraint is these boarding passes have to be printed at 10,000 different airports across the country. And the infrastructure in these airports for printing boarding passes is old. It's this very specific kind. It's not even a dot matrix printer. It's this very specific kind of printer with specific toner that has very strict limitations for what it can print. So the design idea is not the hard part. 100,000 designers could come up with a better design for what it should look like. The hard part is, is that design change worth the $50 million it would require to get new printers and new software and install them in different airports across the country to make that idea possible? And I think that's part of, again, where there's a limitation in, in our design education, that we are taught generally, and there are exceptions, we are taught generally the idea, the idea is what matters. So if you have a great idea, it should be adopted because it's a great idea. But in reality, the idea, again, get, getting back to organizations and systems, every organization is a system that has constraints. It can only produce certain kinds of ideas. So a better designer is going to say, wait, before I spin my wheels making a perfect design, I should ask the question, what are the constraints here? Why is it this way? Let me assume the people who designed this were smart. How could this have happened then? And that takes a lot more effort. It takes some thinking. It also takes designers out of their comfort zone of just going into Photoshop or Sketchpad and just creating. They have to actually study the problem, which is a, the real problem in itself. That's a great story, I think. Drive-by designing is something we do. We forget the reality of what it's like to actually be a designer on a real team where you have constraints and you have limitations, and that's what the job is. The job is working those problems and making something good out of it rather than pretending they don't exist. As great as that would be. How do you think your computer science background informs your view of design? My background is weird. So I started off on a computer science track. I discovered I was a bad programmer about halfway through. Like I'm a mediocre programmer. And then I looked in the course catalog to see what else I could study to maybe make a career out of. And I discovered design. There were design classes I could take as electives. So I took a psychology class, I took a human factors class, and I took an intro to like interaction design class, and I loved it. So I was exposed to that early on. But in terms of, a, in a wider sense, I found like, I think design is universal. It applies everywhere. Engineers, as we talked before, engineers do a kind of design when they sit down to solve a problem. So everybody does a certain kind of design. I think the fact that I studied computer science and interaction design 
and human factors gave me an appreciation for the value of the things every discipline shares and finding ways to show that there are similarities in problem solving for anyone in any role. That's a way you can connect with people who have a different background than you. Everyone's trying to solve a problem and everyone has a method they use to do it. So if you can see it that way, then you have a way in to say, wait, like you're jumping ahead here. In my method, we would ask this other question first. Can we do that this time? And now you have a basis for interacting with anybody, no matter what design training or engineering training they have or they don't have. Support for Design Better comes from Gusto, who make running a small business easy. Get three months free at gusto.com slash design better once you run your first payroll. Running a small business is hard work, especially all of the payroll, quarterly tax filing stuff, and HR things. I'd rather be focused on my business and my customers than dealing with the administrative duties. But Gusto makes it easy. They automated the complicated parts of running a business. With Gusto, I never miss federal or state payroll tax filings, and I love the time off requests and time tracking tools. Gusto even offers a small group health insurance option for nearly any budget. When you run into issues you need help with, their HR experts are ready to help. It's a very well-designed product, easy to use, and great emotional design that will put a smile on your face. Design Better listeners get three months free once they run their first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash design better. That's gusto.com slash design better. Support for Design Better comes from Uplift Desk, who help you work better and live healthier. Eli and I log a lot of hours at our desks, which can be detrimental to one's health if you're not paying attention to ergonomics. Uplift Desk offer high-quality, well-designed desks, chairs, and accessories to help you build an ergonomic workspace for home or work. Eli recently got a standing desk, and I got a human-scale freedom chair. I've been dreaming about this chair for a long time, and I finally got one. I've already noticed a big change in my posture with this chair, and my body thanks me for it. Eli is logging a lot more hours standing than sitting these days, and he can make quick transitions with the flip of a switch. We love Uplift Desk, and we know that you will too. Design Better listeners can get a special deal by visiting upliftdesk.com and use the code DESIGNBETTER at checkout for 5% off your order. You'll get free shipping, free returns, and an industry-leading 15-year warranty. Go to upliftdesk.com, use code DESIGNBETTER, and get 5% off. Design a better workspace with Uplift Desk. Support for Design Better comes from Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery. Design Better listeners can save 50% on their order at factormeals.com slash designbetter50. Use the code designbetter50. You know what happens at my house when things get really busy? In the evenings, we turn to takeout, which can be expensive and it's not very good for our health. Lately, we're making a better choice at crunch time. We turn to Factor for chef created, dietitian approved meals that are ready to eat in just two minutes. We like the flexibility of Factor too. You can change your order up every week with plans from four to 18 meals per week, or you can pause or reschedule your deliveries at any time. The meals are so tasty. My wife and I are huge fans, and I like their smoothies too, which I find are perfect for a quick, healthy breakfast. Factor can help you eat well and feel good while focusing on your career and your family. Head to factormeals.com slash designbetter50 and use the code designbetter50 to get 50% off your order. That's code designbetter50 at factormeals.com slash designbetter50 to get half off your order. Back when Aaron and I started the design education team at Envision, Certainly after he hired me, he's like, okay, we're going to write three books. That's one of the first things we're going to do. I was like, what? <laughs> I, I, I'd never written a book before. I hadn't done all that much writing. I've never really written professionally. Well, if you're going to do one, you may as well do three, right? Like jump right in. Let's go. <laughs> right. And they're short books. But at the same time, I was really surprised by how much I learned through that process. For one thing, I, I learned that I really like writing, but also just covering that material in a way that you're teaching it to others, which shouldn't be a surprise because I've, I've done a fair bit of teaching, just really grounds you and reinforces a lot of things. And you've done a lot of writing yourself. How does writing and then the discipline of writing, how does it help your learning? It's thinking made manifest. A lot of people will say this, that it's only until they write something down, they really understand what they're trying to say. For a class I took in my freshman year in college, it was, it was a class on Eastern philosophy. It was this really gr- one of the best classes I ever took. It was Eastern philosophy as like an experience. So we had to do Tai Chi in the morning. We had to read all these unusual books I'd never heard of before. But part of the class was we had to keep a journal. 
And so that journal was terrible for me in a way. Every journal entry in there was basically written for the professor in the hopes I would get a better grade. So it's a very, very bad self-aware writing. But I was surprised that by the end of the class, I found the process of it really helpful. So I kept going. And I've kept a journal now for, I don't want to admit it, I guess almost 25 years, something like that. Because I found the process of me sitting down with a blank screen and just no one's going to see it. And just, let me, what am I feeling today? And to try to describe that, that loop and that process is a creative and healthy therapeutic loop for me. So it's not a surprise eventually I became a writer because that process is very familiar to me. And then the idea that that's the sketch pad, to use a design metaphor, for what you might prepare to share with the world that you're going to play in here and you can experiment. No one's going to see it, but eventually you can carve it and shape it in a way that you feel good about it and put it out into the world. So I find that combined with the experience of researching and books are a vehicle for getting to talk to people who would never talk to you otherwise. You say, hey, I'm working on a book about a subject you know about. Can I talk to you for 20 minutes? And you get access to people you would never get access to otherwise. For me, I always want to feel like I know what I'm talking about. I do a lot of research when I read books. I'm more driven to read obscure things that haven't come up before. I'm like, maybe this person figured it out in a, a better way than we've heard before. Like the Victor Papernick quote, I'm a reader anyway, but I'm more motivated to dig to find what's already been said here that should be repeated or broadcast louder. For whatever reason, my psychology is just loves that process. It's actually a design process to me. I really think writing and especially book writing, a book is a design thing. What problem are you solving? You prototype it, you get feedback on it, you do an iterative loop, right? It's a different medium, but it's a design process. So in general, I'm so, I love design processes. I guess I see design kind of in almost everything. I see it in writing too. I've seen a video of you writing. I remember a blog post from like a long time ago where you just did a screen capture of you and your writing process. And it really like helped me think about thinking differently. When I think of writing and when I try to write, I try to go from top to bottom. But you did not. You move very nonlinearly. And it looks a lot like when I watch designer friends and colleagues designing a screen, you know, I see all that stuff come together and it's just sort of like lots of random actions that then everything snaps into place and you write in the same way. So one mission I've been on forever, for as long as I've been a writer for sure, is debunking these notions that are somehow very popular in our culture about creativity that are definitely not true. And so I wrote a book called The Myth of Innovation. I had a bunch of them. The Myth of Epiphany is one of them. We fantasize about flashes of insight. We obsess about them. They play a relatively small role in the history of actual breakthroughs and progress in any field. Relatively small. They happen, but are they that important? They're actually not. And so when it comes to writing, part of the mythology there is how many times has anyone actually seen a professional writer writing? Like you never see that. And part of why you never see it is because mostly it's really boring. It's also really boring to watch a painter paint. In a way, it's really boring to watch a designer design. It's a slow process. You're moving things around in Photoshop or in Sketch or whatever you're using, Envision, whatever you're using. You would never make a movie or a film about this. It's not exciting. And so part of what I wanted to do in that video as a writer, I wanted to show people what it's actually like. It's a lot of moving stuff around. It's a lot of gambles. It's a lot of things you throw away. It's a lot of iteration. If I showed that in real time, no one would watch it. It's just too boring. People wouldn't believe that's really what it took Hemingway to write, whom, whom the bell tolls. Uh, like that's what he did. He did it on a typewriter. So I, I made that video to compress it down and show, am I the greatest writer? No, I'm a professional writer. This is what I do. So if I have to kick stuff around, if I rip half of it out and redo it, that's what you're probably going to do too. And that's okay. And I think designers are often very shy about showing their work in progress. It's something that's somehow learned in design school of like, you can't show a sketch. Like, it's not perfect. You're going to get picked on because your lines aren't perfect. Your circle isn't straight. And that's self-defeating to believe that people like Michelangelo, whoever your hero is, made perfect circles all the time. And Michelangelo actually burned all his sketches. He did not want anyone to see his work in progress. It was part of the mythology that he believed in. And I think that's detrimental from a design education perspective. We should be showing what it's actually like for good designers doing their work as they're doing it. It's messy. It's sloppy. A lot of dumb ideas in retrospect are considered. That's the job. But we don't show that anywhere. None of our books show 
the bad sketches that Johnny Ives made. <laughs> you're, like you're never going to see that in our culture. But that's the truth. I'm always after that kind of a truth that should help people who actually have talent and skills, but they're chasing a mythology. They're chasing a romantic idea of what good work actually is. I think it's a big problem. One of the interesting things about Johnny Ive, and we, we may managed to have him in class last year remotely, largely because of COVID and he was probably bored, but, but he came in and he talked about, he starts all his design projects with writing, which I'd never heard before, mm. which I thought was really, really interesting. That's cool. So on the design education front, before we started this, we were talking about, you know, some of the ways in which it's broken or the way that people continue to complain that that design education is broken. And I'm in a program, teaching a program right now that's been around since the late 60s. So it has sort of the advantage of this long tenure, but also maybe some things baked into it that maybe need to evolve or change given how much product design has changed even in the last 10 years. Where, where are some of the blind spots you see right now in design education? First, I have to say that design education is really hard. It's very easy for someone like me to go, why don't they teach this? Why don't they teach? That's easy. What people like me often don't say is, well, in order to teach X, which I think is missing, what am I willing to take out? Like, there's only so much time. And so I have to give credence to, I'm not a professor. I am a teacher, but not in any formalized sense. I don't work in a university. It's hard. So as much as I criticize it, I'm not saying I could do a better job. But the things I think about a lot are the reality of what we want. And what I want is a better design world. I want a better design healthcare system in America. I want better design infrastructure. I want better designed vaccine websites. I want good design as something that's far better embedded in our culture as a basic expectation. And when I look at the world, I see a lot of designers who are skilled. They have good ideas, but they're ineffective at making those ideas become reality in the places they work. So when I think of design education, I think there's two different paths. One is far more emphasized than the other. The first path is design as a solo talent, teaching you how to think about ideas, teaching you about form, teaching you about composition, teaching you about the medium that you're going to work in. It could be 3D, it could be 2D, it could be the web, it could be mobile, whatever, about that medium and how to craft things on your own in that medium that you think are good. And that's important. You need talent. You need people who are just good at designing things. But the other path is really about how that works on a team, how that works in an organization. And the key word I think of is facilitation, is recognizing that for you as a designer, you're not the boss, probably. You're not the GM. You're not the VP. You're not the CEO. You're not the engineering manager. You're this person who has some influence, but you're not the primary decision maker. How are you able to facilitate the transmission of your good ideas and talent into that system? And that, I think, is a failure. It's not emphasized in most places. Sometimes it's covered, it's hinted at, but facilitation or consulting, those are the two skill sets that decide how much of your ideas actually make it out the door. And when I look at the world, I want a better world, that's where I see the biggest gap. And part of facilitation is even telling the story of design. How good are you at talking to an engineer or VP and telling them why they should give a shit about design? That's why I wrote the book, I don't think anyone is going to ever be great at this who isn't already good at it, but we can be better at it if we have better stories that we tell and better models that we use for explaining what we do. And the way we tend to do that now is terrible. We rely on our pedigree. Well, I went to design school. Well, I like that just doesn't work. You don't convince people by relying on the credibility of your turf that they clearly don't care about. You have to facilitate. You have to know their language and their goals and priorities. And a lot of designers who are trained as solo designers find that degrading. Why should I have to? Why should I have to? I hear this a lot. Why should I have to explain what I do? And the answer is you don't. But if you want better stuff to go out the door and you want a better design world, there's no one else who's going to explain this to people other than us. We're the only ones who can do it. Scott, I've always been fascinated by your learning cycle. You've written a number of great books that cover different topics. And to do that, you've got to have a thoughtful approach about going deep into a subject. It requires a bit of bravery, too, to enter the unknown and expect to come out an authority on the other side. Could you walk us through like your learning cycle and how you understand a new space and maybe even develop a new skill? 
I know that fundamentally, I'm just a curious person. I like to know how things work. And I think because I don't really have a strong connection to a particular degree, I am a designer, like I'm an interaction designer, but I'm not really a designer in the full-on sense that most people who are designers are. I'm not a programmer. I'm not, I'm not an engineer, really. Like I was bad at that. <laughs> but I love engineering and thinking about making good things for the world. So I think because I don't really have a stake in the ground, I don't, I don't have anything to defend, it's maybe easier for me to be curious. I don't have a problem going into a situation or a domain where I know nothing and being the person who knows nothing. Like, why is this done this way? Like, why did you make it this choice this way instead of that way? And back when we could go, you know, into restaurants or different places of work, I'm always fascinated by how does this work? Like, how do you decide what to do next? Who has the ideas and who, who gets to veto them or approve? I'm always just curious about how things work. And that curiosity fuels the whole thing because once I start asking a question, the answer usually leads to more questions. Then sometimes I'll discover something that's useful in a field I already know and pull that back into the fold of the design community or the tech community, something from you know, some other industry or for some history book 50 years ago. So I'm just fueled by curiosity and writing and speaking are natural outlets for that because producing these products and people respond to them, if I'm lucky, they'll respond to it and go, oh, you wrote about this. Did you know about that? I'll go, what? And then I'll ask a question about that. So it creates a feedback loop that I follow. And then the craft for me is writing and speaking. Those are crafts that are analogous maybe to design work of how do you craft this? How do you make it refined and polished so it solves the problem you're trying to solve? So it's a combination of, of curiosity and craft. That's why eight books, I've written eight books on different things. I'm mostly engaged by what I don't know or something I'm curious about and I want to know why this is a problem or why this is so great. Scott, you recently published an article titled How to Put Faith in Design. It has a wonderful allegory, or at least to me, it's wonderful because I have a fascination with marine biology <laughs> about the angler fish and how the male is parasitic and attaches itself to its mate and sort of the allegories to design and ethics. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So Mark Hurst wrote an essay called Losing Faith in UX Design, and he has a bunch of very legitimate concerns and angers about the practices of some of our major tech companies, Facebook and Amazon and, uh, and a few others, about ethics and morality and their role in society. And I agree with him that what these organizations do and others do is bad for the society and it's bad for the future. But he conflated user experience design as part of the problem somehow, or it's, he's lost faith in UX. And so I felt like I had to respond to that because I feel like User experience work is a kind of design work, and design work is a skill, a skill set. It's like carpentry. You can't really lose faith in carpentry. A carpenter has a set of goals they're trying to achieve, and they do them. Could they do good carpentry in a building run by someone who does bad things for the world? Sure. And user experience design is no different. You make things that have a good user experience in them. It could be co-opted by the client to do something bad. So I responded to it. And I used the metaphor of the anglerfish because Erica Hall had this great, wonderful Erica Hall had this great tweet where she had a picture of the anglerfish. For those who don't know what it is, it's the fish that has a little glowing orb in front of it that it dangles in front. So little fish come along, get suckered in, and then it eats the little fish. And she compared that little glowing lure to UX design. And that's what UX designers do. We create these nice appendages on basically an evil thing. And so I responded to that metaphor and took it all the way. The anglerfish has this interesting reproductive model. <laughs> the males of the species reproduce with the females by being parasitic. They bite and attach, and they become part of the female. And that's how they have sex, and that's how it works. And so given the anglerfish was the core of this model, I had to make the metaphor that it's very easy as a practitioner with a skill to have that relationship with the place that you work, that you don't approve of what it's doing and you feel like you're along for the ride, and that's common. But we're not male anglerfish. We are not along for the ride. If the people in your organization make bad design decisions, your VP or your head of engineering, whoever it is, and you're like, how could they do that? They're not designers, or they make unethical decisions, then the lesson for us as designers is to say maybe the best and most powerful design decisions are made by people who don't have the word design in your job title. If those roles are making the real design decisions, the real ethical decisions, then you have three choices. One, 
You have to move into those roles where the choices that you think you should be making are made. They could call it the Fooby Dooby, Senior Director of Fooby Dooby. If that's who has the power, go look at that job and get the skills required to get it. Nothing prevents you from doing that. Two, you can decide, I don't want that job. <laughs> I like being a designer. Fine. Then you have to become influential. You have to learn to be a facilitator. You have to learn to understand their language and goals and make arguments that persuade the people who make these decisions. And then the third choice is go somewhere else. Design skills today are more valued probably than ever in the professional world history. I'm not saying I can tell you that it's best for your personal situation to get a new job. I can't tell you that. You might be in the best situation for all your constraints. But you have the power to say, I don't want to work here anymore. I'll take a pay cut or a different work trade-off so I can work somewhere that has values that line up with mine. The fourth choice, which I think is too popular, is just to complain and do nothing. To complain and say, this is terrible, but I'm not going to move into these roles. I'm not going to become an influencer and I'm not going to leave. At that point, it's tough love. And I'm like, then you're the problem because you know it's wrong and you won't do anything about it. And if we want a better design world, we want better ethics, we want better healthcare, we want better political systems, it requires people to be active for change to happen. And so that was my response, that we have choices here. It's not new that corporations are evil and do bad things. And user experience plays a small role in why that happens. What are you reading, watching, or learning today that's inspiring you and maybe giving you ideas for what's next? I'm weird about this because I think I'm old and crusty in a way. I don't really get inspired by new tech products. I tend not to know what the latest things are. I feel like there's a lot of repeating of the same kinds of progress that we have of just making things more convenient that are already kind of more convenient. And I feel like that's a shallow way to think about what design can do. It tends to be very popular and very shiny. A lot of our best designers are in those roles and there's nothing against that. But I tend not to know because it just doesn't, not going to solve the problems I think we really care about. So I've been fascinated by how, and I know that Aaron, you're now involved with this, just what's going on in the world right now with the pandemic and what's the role of design in that? I did an article recently for Fast Company about why the vaccine websites were so bad. Website design is old now, right? Like, shouldn't we be good at basic website design? And we're not. And the ways that decisions are made for our government systems have real fundamental problems in them that I've only in the last year or two become more aware of. So I become more and more interested at these points that are not what we would call sexy design problems. They're not cool and trendy, but they're actually way more significant if we think design is about making the world better making people's quality of life better. The fact that it's hard to get vaccinated because the website is hard to use and inaccessible and crashes if you're on a slow bandwidth. Like, this is basic stuff that we're bad at. So that's probably the thing I'm most interested in is what can I do? What should other designers be doing who have these skills? And how do we get the whole community to care far more about this than the latest iOS upgrade? Like, you know, we have this proclamation about our values and how empathetic we are and how we want the world to be better. But if you look at how we spend our attention, the subject matter that we focus on in our conversations with each other, it's very different than what we proclaim is what we're about. And I want to try to change that about myself, but also about reflecting that back to our community. Why are we not giving our attention over there when that's really where the bigger problems are? I don't know the answer. Actually, Aaron, maybe you do because you're more in this world now than I am. Yeah, uh, I'm with you that investing our time in the things that can have the greatest impact. I'm at a point in my life where I recognize that, you know, there's only so much time on this planet and how might we use our life's energy towards the greatest good. Not always easy to do, but feels like a, a worthwhile thing to do. Scott, where can people learn more about you and your book? The book's called How Design Makes the World. Go to designmtw.com and there's a movie, a short movie about the book, free chapters, all the good stuff is there. And I'm Scott Birkin. You can find me on Twitter at, at Birkin. Scott, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. <laughs>